This is chapter 10, part one. This chapter is about soil and food. So we're gonna start off talking about hunger and we have the term food security. And that just means having daily access to enough nutritious food to be able to live an active and healthy life. And one of every six people in less developed countries is not getting enough to eat. And that's called food insecurity. And people with food insecurity are considered to have chronic hunger and poor nutrition. The root cause of food insecurity is poverty. Other obstacles to food security include political upheaval, war, corruption, bad weather, and bad weather includes drought, floods, and heat waves. To maintain good health and resist disease, people need to consume nutrients. And those nutrients include macronutrients, which are larger molecules, that's carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, and smaller smaller molecules called micronutrients. And micronutrients, you don't need as much. And that includes vitamins and minerals. And for anyone who can't grow enough food or buy enough food is gonna suffer from chronic undernutrition or hunger. And having a deficiency of important nutrients can cause someone to become more vulnerable to catching diseases and it hinders the normal development of children. And here is a bar graph showing you world malnutrition rates. And it's shown as percentage of children under the age of five with stunted growth. And that is a key indicator of malnourishment. So when you look, you have Brazil, as just a little bit over 5% of their children under the age of five have stunted growth. And then you compare that with Ethiopia, which is a little bit more than 50% of children under the age of five have stunted growth. So you can see the malnutrition of Ethiopia is, a, is more of a problem than in Brazil, okay? So vitamin and mineral deficiencies can occur in one or more important vitamin or mineral. And some examples include vitamin A, iron, and iodine. So a lack of vitamin A is going to be related to a problem with blindness in children. And actually about 250,000 to about 500,000 children younger than age six go blind every year from having a lack of vitamin A. And this deficiency is the leading cause of preventable blindness in children. And it can actually be prevented if you were to give a child an inexpensive vitamin A capsule only twice a year. So it's a, it's a very inexpensive fix to the problem. This is a list of some sources of vitamin A. And you're gonna have a lot of products with beta carotene in orange color. So you have sweet potato, pumpkin, carrots, and then you have beef liver, spinach, other things like that. Then you have a lack of iron. A lack of iron can cause anemia, and that could lead to fatigue and other complications. And about one-fifth of the people in the world suffer from iron deficiency. And you can take iron pills, or you can find iron in a, a diet, a fortified diet. So this list shows you sources of iron in food. And I just circled the word fortified and enriched because that is when you have food where they add nutrients to the food. So enriched rice is white rice where they add nutrients to it. And then um, a whole lot of cereals are gonna have 
some sort of enrichment. So those are called fortified. So if you were to look at the box of cereal that you may eat for breakfast, it'll say something about being fortified and then it'll have a list under the nutrition facts. It'll have a list of vitamins and minerals that are found in that cereal. And then here's a list, a whole bunch of other things. Meat, and then oysters, chocolate, lentils. Then you have lack, lack of iodine. So lack of iodine, chronic lack of iodine can cause problems like stunted growth and goiter. And goiter is an enlarged thyroid gland. So you need iodine for your thyroid function. Almost a third of people do not get enough iodine in their diet. And iodine is found naturally in many foods, especially seafood and seaweed. And sea creatures and seaweed gets the iodine more concentrated because they're getting it from the ocean water. And according to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, and the World Health Organization, curing the iodine deficiency would only cost about two to three cents per year for every person in the world. And then also, some salt is called iodized salt. That means that iodine was added to the salt as a dietary supplement. So that's another way of, in, of getting iodine into someone's diet is by using iodine salt, iodized salt. You don't need a lot of iodine in your diet. Here are some sources of iodine. You have seafood, fish, shrimp, seaweed, dairy products, and iodized salt. And then you have an opposite problem where many people have health problems because they ate too much. So that's called overnutrition. That's when a person eats more than the amount of energy that they use up and that can lead to excess body fat. So people who experience overnutrition can actually face similar health problems as those who suffer from undernutrition. And some of those problems include lower life expectancy, greater susceptibility to disease and illness, for example. Now, globally, about 1 billion people have health problems because they don't get enough to eat. And actually, more than that, you have 1.6 billion people face health problems from eating too much. So that's kind of an astounding statistic when you hear it. About 69% of American adults are overweight, and half of those people are considered to be obese. And that's from the BMI chart, the body mass index, and that's on the next slide. And obesity plays a role in one in five deaths in the US, and that could be from heart disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, and some forms of cancer. So here is the BMI chart. You go across with your height and you go down with your weight, and then you see what color you're in. Blue is underweight, green is healthy, yellow is overweight, and then orange is obese, and then red is extremely obese. So then we have the topic of food production. And here's a short video on, about people eating locally, Unlike most suburban two-year-olds, Nathaniel gets to visit his dinner before he eats it. His mother, Tammy, has enrolled the family in the Eat Local Challenge. For one month, they're sticking with foods that are farmed, fished, or raised within the Boston region. They have bacon today. You're getting the freshest food that you could find, the most nutritious, and also you're supporting the local economy. It's all part of a movement started by so-called locavores, people who want fresher food and some who want to see firsthand how their food is grown 
and how animals are handled and fed. It makes you feel like you're in control of what you're eating and what your kids are eating. But the big benefit touted by locavores is the reduction of food miles, the distance that food travels from the farm to the typical American plate. For instance, Iowa families eat carrots that travel 1,600 miles from California. New Yorkers enjoy New Zealand lamb that travels nearly 9,000 miles. And Chile sends grapes 5,000 miles to Columbus, Ohio. So theoretically, if everyone in the U.S. ate one locally produced meal every seven days, we'd reduce our oil consumption in this country by more than a million barrels every week. But the $900 billion food industry says that equation doesn't add up and argues that shipping in huge volumes actually cuts fuel costs and that shoppers will have to drive more and burn more gas to buy all their food locally. What impresses me is the phenomenal effort that, is go that the industry is putting into trying to prove that food miles don't make any sense. It's going to have a lower carbon footprint in the long run to have foods grown locally. Is it good? For Tammy, it's much simpler. <laughs> the food is just fresher and it just tastes better. Tammy admits that preparing every meal from local Whole Foods is a lot of work, and she had to make some exceptions to keep Dad on board. Mm -hmm. If there was no beer, no coffee, I, I would just have to live somewhere, somewhere else for a month. I mean, it just would be undoable. Tammy says she's made great food discoveries in her own backyard and will choose from the local bounty from now on. Okay, so food production has changed drastically over time. And 10,000 years ago, humans began to shift from hunting and gathering to agriculture, growing food and raising animals for, as livestock and for using as labor on the farm. And today, we have three systems of food production that supply most of our food. So we have croplands, which produces mostly grains. We have rangelands, pastures, and feedlots, which produce the meat and dairy, and fisheries and aquaculture that provide us with our seafood. Since 1960, there has been an increase in global food production, and that is because of technological advances. Some examples of these advances include irrigation methods and improvements on irrigation methods, farm machinery and methods. Like, um, for example, there was a, an episode on 60 Minutes with the CEO of Lander Lakes and she was explaining how they use satellite imagery to help them with the farming to make it more efficient. Also, you can use computers and just in general, better equipment, better farm equipment. We have high-tech fishing equipment. There's also been the development of chemical fertilizers and pesticides, the development of varieties of crops that give a better yield and industrialized production of livestock and fish. And we're gonna go through a lot of these in the lecture on chapter 10. So first we're gonna start with agriculture. So there are two categories of agriculture. Agriculture is growing crops and that is divided into two categories. We have traditional agriculture and industrialized agriculture. Industrialized agriculture requires high inputs of heavy equipment, large amounts of money, fossil fuels, water, and commercially produced chemicals, for example, inorganic fertilizers and pesticides. And all of that is in order to produce single crops. When you grow a single crop, it's called a monoculture. For example, having a corn field and you're, you're only growing corn on your farm or only growing soybeans. So that's a monoculture. And the main goal of industrialized agriculture is to increase the yield 
of crops. So crop yield is just the amount of food produced by unit of land. So the main goal of industrialized agriculture is to increase the amount of crops that you get on a piece of land that you're farming on. Industrialized agriculture is used mostly in more developed countries and it produces about 80% of the world's food. Then you have plantation agriculture, which is a form of industrialized agriculture, but it's used primarily in tropical and less developed countries, or tropical less developed countries. And that would include cash crops, such as bananas, soybeans, sugarcane, coffee, palm oil, and various vegetables. And most of these crops are grown on large monoculture plantations and mostly they are exported to more developed countries. So this is a photo of an oil palm plantation. And this land used to be covered with tropical rainforest. And when you destroy a tropical rainforest and you put a plantation there instead, you are drastically reducing the biodiversity in the area because instead of having a diverse tropical rainforest that has many animals and plants, you are just having one type of plant where you used to have many, many, many different varieties of species. Now you just have one plant there. In this case, it's the oil palm trees. So is industrialized agriculture sustainable? Modern industrialized agriculture is not sustainable and it violates the principles of sustainability because it relies heavily on fossil fuels, it reduces biodiversity, and it disrupts nutrient cycles. Then we have traditional agriculture. Traditional agriculture provides about 20% of the world's food crops, mostly in less developed countries. And there are two main types of traditional agriculture. You have subsistence farming, which uses natural inputs of sunlight, human and animal labor. And the goal is to produce enough crops just for the farm's family's survival. So you have a farm and the family living on the farm is growing food for their own survival. And they're not going to have that much left over to sell or to store away for later. In traditional intensive agriculture, farmers increase their inputs of labor, including draft animal labor, which if you look at the top corner, there's a picture of a couple of horses. And they're pulling a mach they're pulling this, uh, machinery so that they're using animals to help with the farming. Also, you're going to add inputs of animal manure to use as fertilizer, and you're adding water to try and obtain higher crop yields. And then the higher yields are allowing for some to be left over to sell for income. So traditional agriculture is more sustainable than industrialized agriculture. And that's because it requires a low input of resources and it typically maintains a higher level of biodiversity of the land because usually traditional agriculture involves growing more than one type of crop on the farmland. And that's called polyculture. That's when you grow multiple crops on the same land. Polyculture, again, is a sustainable farming practice, and there are different reasons why it is sustainable. One of the reasons is that it allows for crop diversity, which reduces the chance of losing most of or all of the year's food supply if there were pests or bad weather. You know, if you all of a sudden have a fungus, let's say, and the fungus only affects certain types of plants, 
you're not going to lose your entire yield of all of your crops if you have multiple different types of crops growing on your field you'll lose maybe some and not all and different crops mature and are harvested at different times so that allows you to have food production through more times during the year also it keeps the soil covered with crops for a long a longer period of time and that reduces soil erosion from winds and water. Then there's less need for fertilizer and water because the root systems from different plants go down into the soil at different depths. And that allows different plants to capture different nutrients and moisture more efficiently. Insecticides and herbicides are rarely needed actually because the farm creates a habitat for natural predators of crop eating insects. So when you have a lot of different plants, you're gonna have more spiders, let's say, and the spiders will eat, let's say, grasshoppers that would otherwise eat the crops. Also, weeds are gonna have more trouble competing if you have many plants on the farm. So you actually have less weeds. You don't need to use as much herbicide to kill the weeds. And comparisons actually show that polyculture farms on average produce higher yields of crops than, mono, than monoculture plantations do. So how do we increase crop yields? Farmers can either farm on more land or they can get higher yields from existing land. And there's something called the Green Revolution. So since 1950, most of the increase in global food production has come from industrialized agriculture. And that came with the, the use of high inputs of fertilizer and pesticides and high yield crop varieties. And we'll go through the details here. The first green revolution was between 1950 and 1970. And that was a rise in high input agriculture. And it resulted in a dramatic increase in crop yields in most of the world's more developed countries, especially the US. And again, keep in mind, high input means you're adding a lot into the system. You add in a lot of fuel, a lot of money, a lot of water, a lot of chemical fertilizers and pesticides. That's high input. And you included monocultures of selectively bred key crops. A key crop would be rice, wheat, or corn. And selectively bred means they bred crops that were, let's say, more hardy in the winter or they could withstand drought better. Or crops that were engineered to be high yield. Also, it, the green revolution and industrialization of agriculture requires a large quantity of synthetic inorganic fertilizers and pesticides fuel and water, like I said before. Then there was a second green revolution and that has been taking place since about 1967. And that is characterized by monoculture of crops such as rice and wheat, specifically bred for tropical and subtropical climates. And that was mainly in less developed countries such as India, China, and Brazil. So the first green revolution was in the world's more developed countries. The second green revolution was in more of the less developed countries. And the results of the green revolutions were that we saw world green production triple between 1961 and the year 2009. And since 1950, the industrialized agriculture in the US has more than doubled the yields of key crops, 
such as wheat, corn, and soybeans without having to cultivate additional land. And this graph shows you the grain production in millions of metric tons versus the year. And you see total world grain production is increasing since about 1961. And the grains are considered to be wheat, corn, and rice in this graph. More results of the green revolutions include people directly consuming about 48% of the world's grain production. So we were able to increase the amounts of grain consumed. And then about 35% of that grain production is used to feed livestock. So you have additional grain to feed additional livestock. And then later in chapter 10, we will discuss the livestock and meat industry. And you'll see a lot of animals are fed grain products. And that, in, that is related to the fact that we have more grain being, being harvested. And then about 17% of the grain, mostly corn, is used to make biofuels such as ethanol, and that's used for vehicles. So next time you go to the gas station, look at the gas pump, it'll have a sign that says something about ethanol and it tells you what percent ethanol is in that gasoline. So in the United States, we have industrialized farming that has, ev that has evolved into agribusinesses. And the agribusiness would is a small number of giant multinational corporations. So for example, Cone Agra. Cone Agra is the main company and then they own lots of smaller companies. So when you look at food that you have in your home, you will see a brand name and then sometimes very small on the back of the product, it might say Con Agra. And these large corporations control most of the steps in the food process. So the growing, the processing, the distribution, and the sale of the food. And then next we're gonna talk about organic agriculture. Organic agriculture is when crops are grown without the use of synthetic pesticides, and without inorganic fertilizers and without genetic engineering. And animals must be raised on 100% organic feed without the use of antibiotics or growth hormones. And this chart shows you the differences between industrialized and organic agriculture. This is from the textbook. Okay, and you could read through this. Then we have crossbreeding and genetic engineering that we're going to talk about. And this is how you produce different varieties of crops, the, the plants, and um, different varieties of livestock animals. So crossbreeding is when you use artificial selection or selective breeding. And this is been used for centuries by farmers and scientists to develop genetically improved varieties of crops, such as corn and livestock animals. And this is the first gene revolution, we call it. And it yielded amazing results. For example, over many years, corn was adapted from a Mexican wild grass into the ears of corn that we see today. And you can see in this diagram, you have a little tiny thing that's from the wild grass. The, and then on the bottom is the ear of corn that we recognize. So the ears of corn that we eat today is not the original corn, okay? That came from 
selective breeding, breeding larger and larger plants. Um, you know, when you had the little, the little ear of corn, and then let's say one plant has a little bit of a larger ear of corn. So then you would breed that with another one that had a larger ear of corn. And then over many years, you end up with larger ears of corn. That's selective breeding. And then this is just another diagram of the early Mexican wild grass. And then you have the modern ear of corn. And they use a quarter in the picture to show the scale of the early ear of corn. I mean, it's not even an ear of corn. It, um, and then you have what we recognize as an ear of corn today. So then you have genetic engineering. And that is when modern scientists can create new organisms using genetic engineering, which is going to include adding, deleting, or changing segments of the actual DNA of an organism. And that's considered to be the second gene revolution. And when you do this, you're, the point is to produce desirable traits or to eliminate undesirable traits. So when you eliminate parts of the DNA, it's gene splicing. And the resulting organisms are what's called genetically modified organisms or GMOs. Now developing a new crop variety through gene splicing is faster than selective breeding. It also usually costs less and it also allows for the insertion of genes from almost any other organism into crop cells. For example, the flavor saver tomato, which was approved in 1994, was the first genetically engineered food to reach the public. And it was genetically modified by injecting flounder genes, like the fish, the flounder fish. They took genes from a flounder and then the DNA was injected into tomato genes. So that allowed the tomato to last better in cold temperatures, but they found it did not hold up in shipping and consumers did not like it. And then it was eventually taken off the market. Now they talk more about this in a documentary called The Future of Food, if you're interested in maybe finding it and watching it. Currently, at least 80% of the food products on the US supermarket shelves contain some form of genetically engineered food or ingredients, but no law requires the labeling of GM products. Although some brands have started to label their foods, where it'll say on the side, of a box, it'll say, um, not made with any genetically modified organisms. So some, some General Mills brand products have started to label saying that. You could look at other brands as well and see if you can find any labels like that. So bio, bioengineers plan to develop new genetically modified varieties of crops that are resistant to heat, cold, herbicides, insect pests, parasites, viruses, drought, and different issues that might be afflicting soil, like salty soil or acidic soil. And they also hope to develop crop plants that can grow faster and survive with little or no irrigation and with less fertilizer and pesticides. So I just wanna point out here, when they talk about being resistant to herbicides, an example of that is Roundup Ready soybeans. So there is Roundup, which is an herbicide. Roundup Ready, Soybeans means that they are a particular variety of soybeans that were genetically modified so that when you spray a field with herbicides, 
the soybean plants don't get affected by the herbicide called Roundup. So they're called Roundup Ready, okay? So those were genetically modified and engineered to be resistant to certain herbicides. That's one example. Currently about 61 countries require labeling of food that contains GMOs, but the US is not one of them. And that's largely because companies can lobby US Congress and state legislatures to oppose GMO food labeling. If brands do not label their food as being non-GMO, then people can rely usually on certified organic food. So if food is labeled 100% organic or USDA certified organic, that means that they were not able, they were not made with any genetically modified seeds or ingredients. So there is some controversy over genetically engineered foods. A pro would be that genetically modifying food is potentially a sustainable way to solve world hunger problems and improve, in, improve human health. And then some cons include people who warn that we know too little about the long-term potential harm to humans and to the ecosystems from using GMOs. They also warn that genetically modified organisms released into the environment may cause some unintended harmful genetic and ecological effects. And that genes in plant pollen from genetically modified crops can spread among non-engineered species. And then those new strains can form hybrids with wild crop varieties, and it would reduce the natural genetic biodiversity of the wild strains. Also, there is a question about people having reactions to GMOs. And this is from a New York Times article from the year 2000. And it was also discussed in that documentary I just mentioned called The Future of Food. So a woman went into anaphylactic shock after eating enchiladas, potentially because of a severe reaction. It was a severe allergic reaction to Starlink. Starlink is a gene modified corn, which was not approved for human consumption. It was only meant for animal feed, but somehow the corn ended up being used to make certain taco shells, and then they ended up being recalled. But this woman had a severe allergic reaction after eating it. It may have been because of the GMO Starlink genetically modified corn. And then here we have trade-offs of genetically modified crops and foods. You could read through that. 